Good evening, visitors. Good evening, visitors. Welcome to the Australian War Memorial's last post ceremony. My name is Jared Pratt, and joining us today from the Royal Australian Navy is Warrant Officer Jason Russ. Today we commemorate the Battle of the Atlantic. The fight for control of the Atlantic sea lanes raged for six arduous years, from the earliest days of the Second World War to the final hours of the conflict in Europe. Sir Winston Churchill called it the dominating factor all through the war. At its core was the Allied naval blockade of Germany, announced the day after the declaration of war, and Germany's counter blockade. Both sides battled to control shipping and trade routes and the ability to project military forces across the seas. This struggle involved thousands of ships in more than 100 convoy battles in innumerable single ship encounters in a theatre covering millions of miles of ocean. U-boat attacks were, at first, dramatically successful, as Germany also sent out its major surface warships and air power for combined assault by air, surface and submarine forces. The Royal Australian Navy's anti-submarine school, HMAS Rushcutter, was commissioned in February 1939. But with the Royal Navy in dire need of officers and sailors trained in anti-submarine warfare, these men soon found themselves on loan. By the end of 1943, over 1,000 Australian officers and ratings were serving in British ships. By May 1941, the Allies had developed a fully escorted transatlantic convoy system. A number of RAN vessels served on such escort duties. HMAS Australia began convoy escort operations off the west coast of South Africa in May 1940 and remained in the Atlantic until February 1941, operating as far south as the Cape of Good Hope and as far north as the, as the Arctic Circle. Eventually, German surface attacks on trade routes collapsed with the loss of the battleship Bismarck. Involved in the Bismarck action were four young Australians serving in the, the British battlecruiser HMS Hood. Australians were involved in many other parts of the battle, from Australian air crew serving with RAF Coastal Command to the defensively equipped merchant ship sailors of the Royal Australian Navy Reserve. Each year on the first Sunday in May, we remember those who died during the longest continuous military campaign of the Second World War. Today, we, re we pay our respects to the men and women commemorated here on the Roll of Honour and to the survivors who returned home. We're honoured to acknowledge Air Commodore Robert Chipman, representing both the Chief of the Defence Force and the Chief of Air Force. Mr John King, President, ACT Branch, Returned and Services League of Australia. We warmly welcome the nine Royal Australian Navy and Merchant Navy veterans of the Battle of the Atlantic who are joining us this evening. Gentlemen, we thank you all for your service. We would also like to acknowledge Mr Walter Wright, a Battle of the Atlantic veteran who sadly passed away before today's anniversary. We would like to express our deepest sympathies to Mr Wright's family and friends. We also welcome students from the International Peacekeeping Operations Training Centre. And as usual, we welcome the veterans who have served, those that are still serving, and the families that support them. We acknowledge the members of RSL and Services Clubs Association, RSL Victoria and RSL Queensland, who are watching the broadcast of this ceremony from across Australia. During the ceremony, Wreaths will be laid at the base of the Pool of Reflection by visitors and students on behalf of the following schools. From Victoria, Eltham College Primary Department and Williamstown North Primary School. 
If able, I invite you all to please stand and join in singing the national anthem. Students, please be seated. If you're able, please be seated. The Australian War Memorial was the vision of Charles Bean, Australia's first World War official historian. Bean landed with the Australian troops on Gallipoli and stayed with them at the front through until the end of the war. The idea of this national memorial and museum came to him at Pozieres, France, in the depths of the bloody fighting of 1916. Bean's idea was that this would be a place where families and friends could mourn loved ones buried in faraway places. It would also be a place that could help all Australians understand what these men and women had endured and what they had done for us. Bean's vision, to which we remain true, is best expressed as inscribed in the entrance to the memorial's galleries. Here is their spirit in the heart of the land they loved, and here we guard the record which they themselves made. Tonight, we will read the story behind just one of those on the Roll of Honour which lists the names of more than 102,000 men and women who have given their lives for us in war and operations for more than a century. But first, we present a lament, Flowers of the Forest. Wreaths or floral tributes will now be laid at the base of the Pool of Reflection.
Today, we remember and pay tribute to Flying Officer Wilbur James Dowling. Wilbur Dowling was born on the 29th of May, 1909, to James and Jessie Dowling of Bendigo, Victoria. After his education, he was involved in the Cadet Corps and was a sheep and cattle farmer. In November 1940, Dowling travelled to Melbourne to enlist in the Royal Air Force and began training as a pilot. In June 1941, a month after receiving his flying badge, he married Moira Doreen Sullivan. He continued training in Australia for another year before being posted to Mount Batten, Plymouth to complete his pilot's course. By the time of his deployment, Dowling had flown a number of aircraft, aircraft including Ansons and Tiger Moths. After completing his pilot's course in June 1942, Dowling was posted to number 461 Squadron of Royal Australian Air Force, Royal Austra Royal Air Force Coastal Command. Created on the 25th of April 1942 and composed primarily of Australians, number 461 Squadron was known as the Anzac Squadron. In 461 Squadron, Dowling piloted short Sunderland flying boats searching for German U-boats over the Bay of Biscay and playing a major role in the Battle of the Atlantic. In June 1943, Dowling was one of 11 men on board Sunderland EJ-134, known as N for Nuts. Six hours into a U-boat seeking mission, N for Nuts was attacked by eight German Junker 88 fighter bombers. The Sunderland was badly damaged. Fire spread throughout the cockpit and the wireless operator and navigator were wounded by shrapnel. Miraculously, the Sunderland managed to evade the Junkers after an hour of offensive fire, landing on a public beach in Cornwall after making the nearly 500 kilometre journey home. And for nuts broke up on the beach after landing. The Sunderland crew lost one member, pilot officer Ted Miles, and became famous throughout Coastal Command. The Chief of Staff of the RAF, Sir Charles Portal, acknowledged the gallantry of Dowling's Sunderland crew, stating that this epic battle will go down in history as one of the finest instances in this war of the triumph of coolness, skill and determination. Two months later, on the 13th of August, 1943, Dowling, along with seven other crew members from N for Nuts, found themselves on another seemingly routine anti-submarine patrol. In the early afternoon, Dowling Sunderland reported by radio that the aircraft was under attack from six German Junker 88 fighter bombers. That was the last message received from the Sunderland no remains of the aircraft were found. The crew were officially presumed dead in 1944. Fellow RAF Coastal Air Crew, tail gunner Jack Edge, stated that those lost over the Atlantic during their service in RAF Coastal Command, their only monument can be a friend's remorse and a loved one's tears, but they are not forgotten. Wil Wilbur Dowling has no known grave. His name appears on the Runnymede Memorial, Surrey, alongside the names of 20,288 other Allied casualties. He was 34 years of age. His name is listed on the honour roll to my left, among almost 40,000 Australians who died while serving in the Second World War. His photograph is displayed today beside the Pool of Reflection. This is but one of the many stories of service and sacrifice told here at the Australian War Memorial. We now remember Flying Officer Wilbur James Dowling, who gave his life for us, for our freedoms, and in the hope of a better world.
If you're able, please stand for the reading of the ode and the sounding of the last post. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Lest we forget. Lest we forget. We leave you this evening with the words of the memorial's founder, Charles Bean. Many a man lying out there at Pozier or in the low scrub at Gallipoli with his poor, tired senses barely working through the fever of his brain has thought in his last moments, well, well, it's over. But in Australia, they will be proud of this. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, that concludes the last post ceremony. We thank you all for visiting the Australian War Memorial and wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. <laughs>